Okay, welcome to Alchemist Book Club. So nice to see you all today on the Saturday afternoon, eager to know about a new book. And we are going to discuss a lot about today's book, uh, Blink. But before we go into the book, let me just take a few minutes now to introduce some of the newcomers about what Alchemist Book Club is all about. So Alchemist Book Club started in the year 2018. And we are now a three and a half year old book club with a bunch of enthusiasts. Basically, they all love books. We discuss books of various genres. It's an open and a free club for all book lovers. And we meet on the second and last Saturdays of every month, discussing one book every meeting. These are some of the books that we have covered over a period of uh, three years. Some of the meetings that happened uh, for, I mean, some of the books have been covered for more than one meeting, and some of the meetings have been covered by authors themselves coming over and addressing us. So you can also become a member, and if you're already a member, just a reminder that these are all the prerequisites. You have a passion for reading, you want to read, you're a book lover, you recommend books in the group, you share your insights from whatever you are reading, you share the quotes from the books, and participate in the book discussions of what others are sharing and attend at least six to eight meetings in a year. That's not too much to ask for now that there are 24 meetings in a year. And of course, take up some facilitation roles so that you can come and share about your learnings from the books and help build the community. So that is in a short nutshell about uh, what Alchemist Book Club is. And if you are here for the first time, I'll be sharing a link in the comments session later where you can fill up a form and then you will be uh, joining the WhatsApp group. Okay, You will come to know about all the activities that we do in the book club. So let's move on to today's session. And the today's session is going to be on this book called Blink. We are at 3.35 now. Um, the power of thinking without thinking. And we have 16 people join already. So that's great. So let's move ahead on the Great. Blink. The caption goes like this, the power of thinking without thinking. So Blink is a book about how we think without thinking, about the choices that appear to be made in an instant, in the blink of an eye, so to say, that actually aren't as simple as they seem. The number of pages in this book is 265. The first copy was released in January 2005, it's 16 years now. And the author is Malcolm Gladwell, who was a business and science reporter at Washington Post. So basically, he's a research journalist. Okay, And to me, Malcolm came across as a very good storyteller because a psychology book, you know, getting so much of an attention with so much of experiments and connecting all of them together, the way he had taken the subject is so much interesting. Uh, if you can look at even a science student like me, an engineering student like me to get interest on psychology, so he did a good job. Actually, Malcolm Gladwell's second book is this. The first one was The Tipping Point, which was a raging success, followed by this book in uh, 2005. So the book starts with this uh, context of a statue that didn't look right. So here is a statue which was uh, you know, promoted by an art dealer to a museum called J. Paul Getty Museum in California for $10 million, saying that this statue belongs to 6th century BC. And uh, the art dealer, the owner who possesses this uh, statue, was saying that he is willing to give this to the museum for $10 million after inspection. So this was in 1983. So this statue is called Porus. And this is a seven feet tall, nude, young male youth, okay, where his, uh, his left foot is forward and the arms at his sides. So it is made of uh, the uh, marble from Cape Bathy Quarry. And uh, based on the calcite deposit that has been found on the statue, it was calculated that it must be over hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. So a lot of experiments and uh, investigation was going through this because Getty in California is a 
a new museum and one such statue was available the same similar kind of statue was available only in the national archaeological museum in athens so getty was very keen on getting this so that it can become a star attraction for their museum in california but investigation after investigation everything was going right but something was not getting okay 14 months has gone past and then getty museum released in the newspaper the director released in the newspaper this is one of the major star attraction that is going to come to the museum and to america okay that's a kind of a statement that he released but because there was also some contentions whether this is a forgery or whether it this is right you know this is really the you know old one they shipped it to athens okay they they took they hired they rented this and they shipped it to athens and called the most senior okay historians art historians sculpture artists and directors of other museums in order to come over and have a look and say what do they think about this once they landed and once they had a look at the statue i am just putting here some of the feedbacks okay of what they said when they looked into this particular statue all these are famous you know art uh, collectors or art historians who have seen statues for years okay they have been researching on them and one of them had said the first word that comes to my mind it's fresh and fresh is not the word that you know you will you will associate for an antique like this right and the second one anyone who has been in sculpt sculpture coming out of the ground will tell you this has never been on the ground who has seen sculpture coming out another one remarked it seemed dipped in a very best cafe latte from starbucks i felt there is a glass between me and the work i'm not too sure but there seemed to be a glass i'm not able to associate with it and felt an intuitive repulsion and this is what all these people are commenting they are not able to pinpoint what is wrong with this but there there is something within them which was telling them that this is not right later after all the investigation that was done in the next few months that followed they found out actually this is a fake the records didn't match the bank account which seemed to have been you know opened in 1952 was not open till 1963 in fact this statue was made in 1980 just 3 years before they took it to the museum in a forgery gallery forgery shop in switzerland and one more identical statue of this was there in that you know swiss so even now you'll be able to find this statue in the catalog of uh, you know j paul getty museum saying that about bc 530 or modern forgery the experts were able to point out there is something wrong here okay the author then jumps on to not from the experts and moving on to someone else okay gamblers now imagine that there are four decks of cards in front of you two decks of red color and two decks of blue color ones as in the gambling what goes around is that you pick up the card and when you win you win and when you lose you lose okay the red ones are kept in such a way that they are mind filled there are high rewards but if you pick up a wrong card there are even higher penalty and the blue ones are steady payouts of 50 dollars but a very minor penalty but the entire card is structured in such a way that actually when you pick up blue you will win at the end okay that's the way it is design but this was not informed to the gamblers okay who are not experts and they were asked to pick up the cards now the entire strategy of what is happening with the cards right on an average the gambler was able to pick up at the 50th card on an average most of them by 80th card almost everyone who had been tested was able to find out that this is what is happening the red is dangerous blue is safe bet but the experiment didn't stop here what they did is also to each and every gambler who is picking up they connected some sensors to their palms so that it will be able to sense the sweat glands that will be you know uh, the the perspiration that will happen the sweat glands under the palms and that will be sent to the sensors and the interesting thing that was noted was whenever these gamblers were reaching out to the red card at the 10th time the sweat glands 
gave the signal. That is 40 cards before the mind figured out the strategy of the game. So this is the second thing that, you know, the author says that how there is something inside us which is able to actually throw out what is happening in and around us, but not in a very traditional medium, but in other mediums like sweat glands. So he says that our brain uses two different strategies. So he says brain interchangingly, but we can say that it's a mind. One is a conscious strategy, which is basically more into analytics and you know experiences, very logical and reasoning kind of a mind, where it tries to figure out over a period of time with the data that is available, that what is actually happening with the cards. That's a conscious strategy. And that's what people have done. In the 50th card, they were able to figure out. And the second one, he calls it as adaptive conscious strategy, where he says, this is quick and fast, because at the 10th card is able to figure out, right? It's quick and fast, but it gets the clues from somewhere that, hey, this is what the strategy is. So that's why it's titled as figuring out the game before even you figure out the game. So they, he doesn't use the word subconscious in the book across, okay? I do not know why, but he calls it as adaptive conscious, okay? And it is not unconscious, like what Sigmund Freud says. It's not unconscious. It's adaptive conscious strategy where it is able to give the signals that something is wrong here. But what do we tell our kids or what we heard from our parents when we were the kids? These are all the, some of the things that we heard, right? Haste makes waste. Look before you leap. Stop and think. Don't judge the book by its cover. Basically, collect as much information and data as possible so that you can be sure about the decision what you're taking. And this is how we have been always trained. But the author argues and he puts forth his first suggestion that decisions made quickly can be every bit as good as decisions made cautiously and deliberately. So he says that the adaptive conscious strategy, which is a subconscious man, mind, coming out with the blink of an eye, an intuitive thing that, you know, what works here, what's the kind of a strategy is as much effective that like a conscious strategy where you process a lot of data. Oh. TG, you compared it with the unconscious strategy of Sigmund Freud, no? No, it's not unconscious. He doesn't not unconscious. It like unconscious. I think he's the term, is it adaptive conscious or adaptive unconscious strategy? Adaptive unconscious, I'm sorry. What did I write? You wrote adaptive conscious. Sorry, it's adaptive unconscious, okay? Yeah, thanks for that uh, info. Anil, thanks for pointing that out. So it's adaptive unconscious strategy, smart. And uh, actually subconscious was used much earlier also in 1960s, there are a lot of books which talks about subconscious and things like that. But Malcolm Gladwell has not chosen to use, you know, subconscious over here. Okay. Now, how subconscious mind? So let's use it in our book club meeting. That subconscious mind, okay, which, which Malcolm is not using. How subconscious is mind is able to actually go into the root of the thing, and within the tenth card, it's able to figure out, hey, this is a strategy of the deck. So the author talks about thin slicing. Okay, so it's basically he talks about the art of breaking down enormous amount of data that is coming, okay, through the through our sense organs, and make use of the minimum of those that will be necessary to make the decision. What is the most important thing that is required in order to make a decision at this point of time? Just take that information. So, our subconscious mind tries to uncomplicate it. It, it works in a very, in a way that whatever be the very complex phenomena that is happening around, it will be able to slice it out and uncomplicate it by finding the underlying signature and arriving at a decision super fast. 
Okay, so this is where we are in terms of the thin slicing. Okay, I will stop here. It's 20 minutes now and open out. Okay, uh, to the team, like, have you felt this in action in any areas of your life? Have you taken any decisions where you think in the moment of that, you know, time I was able to decide could be the way, you know, you picked up your car or a house, or even you got married, you fell in love. Okay. Did it happen? Or you always believe, no, it's data. It's like, you need to analyze. What do you think? Yeah, Navani. My decisions have always been uh, in a blink. Who's that? Venki. Hi, Venki. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So, I mean, I, I always feel that if I plan, I kind of fail. So, you know, I try tend to act immediately. Act immediately. Okay. So, you, you depend more on your hunch. Yeah. Anybody else? I think uh, this one, yeah. uh, you know, while we were doing our MBA so that we would have spared off the subject of research methodology. Because uh, <laughs> even now also to get a doctorate, you need to go through that research methodology and prove something else. Something is true or false, some hypothesis, no? based on a kind of data, which is sometimes cumbersome. So I think we can always quote uh, Malcolm's uh, work to say that uh, you know, snap judgments or <laughs> instinctive judgments are very good rather than going in for rational decision making. <laughs> yeah, but uh, the professor will ask you to complete the book and come because he is going to throw <laughs> some good please here now. So the starting of the book is very interesting, but yes. But then I think sometimes it's true that you know rather than going in for a kind of rational analysis, sometimes it's uh, useful and beneficial to take a kind of instinctive decision but as you rightly said that uh, in that thin slice technique, we unconsciously go towards some kind of reference, you know, some kind of bit of evidence which you would have gathered in the past based on which we would make a decision or, uh, you know, kind of thing. I think it's yeah. always not unconscious, as you rightly said. It is adaptive unconscious that we talk about. So although we talk about it as snap judgment or instinctive, but then we would be having some data in our mind, may not be consciously, but unconsciously based on which we may take decisions. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Amin. Yeah, I. Uh, TG, can I go? Yeah, yeah, please. Who's that? Yeah. So it also depends on the value, probably. So a decision is made depending on how important it is. Also, like you know, uh, the long uh, impact, you know, the um, many years impact kind of a thing to a short term impact, probably. So. Uh, Things of like say for instance uh, when uh, when you uh, look into a store you see a piece of uh, uh, jewelry or a sari you just instantly make up your mind okay that's the piece but yeah. whereas if you have to make a decision like a, a serious uh, decision then you put a sword you you know you analyze a little more though your instinct you go to an extent but you always make uh, at least I make sure that uh, is there some kind of uh, uh, better understanding before I plunge into that decision. So that's how I work. So we put more trust on the conscious strategies than the, the adaptive unconscious. Okay. Yes. No? No? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Is it true with everyone? Why do you think, think so much? <laughs> No, actually, uh, quite opposite happened uh, in my case. Um, like during my, uh, it was an arranged marriage. So we had to go through more than five or six. I had to go through more, talking more, more than five or six boys. But then finally, when I decided, we decided within two minutes that this was the person. <laughs> That's a long term uh, thing. But then still, I could make the decision. And I know something was wrong with the other people and this was the one who was right. I don't know how, but that is exactly what this book is all about. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He also talks about this and Kalpana from what uh, Lakshmi, is it Lakshmi who shared? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. 
yeah unlike a jewelry or sari okay it's a life partner choice so lakshmi had made a very important decision in her life based on an you know a blink of an eye and it happens yeah okay so let's continue with the session in terms of you know seeing what else the author is talking about and whenever you feel you need to interrupt please interrupt okay and you want to share anything because um, yeah, yeah this is a discussion based uh, you know uh, book club meeting if you don't mind like can i add on please so I, please go ahead uh, you know like i was just after hearing all the discussions uh, i just uh, had a point in my mind so what is the connectivity between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind like taking decisions you know as such like uh, the subconscious mind it takes uh, you know like uh, due to various previous experiences or uh, you know um, the knowledge which has already got through conscious thing i think the subconscious uh, profile would have been built up so as like uh, lakshmi it? pointing it out uh, due to the previous five or six experiences where she got uh, to understand where this is good not good kind of thing and which would have given her a clarity and finally like when something clicks up so i am just taking it as an example is it so i feel like there is some connectivity which might help these uh, you know that blink can work only when there were previous other some uh, conscious uh, experiences i feel that is that should yeah. be that's my yeah yeah can i rephrase it babu for uh, my understanding it's basically what you're saying is whatever is there in the unconscious is through the conscious so conscious would have played a role yeah yeah that's what i am also trying okay to. so hold your thought on that it's a very important point so um, remind me when we discuss about rope okay that's a clue okay 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 so that's great now first we need to understand let's continue the session and i i request all of you to put yourself on mute please yeah so so far so good i think your understanding is all you know good so it's going great my mic is working and video is working so i'm pretty sure that all of you are listening keenly now let's get into a very interesting part now thin slicing is basically a large amount of data i break it down into the smallest part and based on that one factor alone can i decide which is what the subconscious mind seem to be doing because i don't understand the subconscious mind because it's not a conscious mind so the author takes to an experiment called low lab interesting word right low lab so the the, the psychologist is uh, john cotman okay very interesting exercise of what he had gone through for more than a decade what he does is he calls two young couples who are in the mid 20s who have high aspiration they got recently married okay and they are living alone and uh, you know they they have they have their own job they are independent 3000 such couples he calls them to a lab makes them sit in separate chairs with a video camera focusing on their face each one two cameras navani note and there are sensors which are fitted on to their body to measure the heart rate every second temperature and also how the chair if it is moving or you know if they are jiggling in the chair you know so all these are fed into the computer basically what is he doing 3000 couples sensors and he is asking them to speak for exactly 15 minutes in a topic of any point of contention okay something like you know i got a pet no why did you get a pet no no why you are not able to uh, come to the party on that you know some point of contention is what they need to speak about for 15 minutes that's it and with this they were able to categorize 15 minutes into uh, 60 seconds 900 emotions each person they were able to categorize and fit it onto the computer and each second based on the facial expression they will find out like what is the emotion they are emoting at that particular second husband and wife for example one is disgust seven is anger 10 is defensive two is contempt okay 14 is neutral like that okay so the, the entire list is like that this is called spaff code spaff code s p a f f now all this data complex data is being fed into the system enormous amount of data now over a period of time by analyzing what actually gotman wanted to find is how will their marriage this couple's marriage will be in the next 15 years that's the answer he wants to find 
whether they will be still a family or divorced. This is this, you know, uh, experiment. What you could find is even though there are 900 each, so 1,800 emotions, and there are 20 such things possible in every second, he found out there are four key emotions that are very, very important. He calls them as four horsemen emotions. Defensiveness, stonewalling, which is very, you know, calm, you know it's, it's highly you know, prevailing with uh, husbands, males. Criticism, which predominantly with the women. And then contempt. These are all the four things to look for. The rest of the things are okay because in any relation, in husband and wife relation, all the other things like neutral or, you know, submissive or anger, all these things are okay. It all will be there. But these four things is what he was going after. And over a period of research, he was able to find out while criticism and contempt both look similar. Criticism is I'm criticizing because you're wrong. But contempt is I'm criticizing because you're wrong. I am right. I am holier than thou. I'm, I'm standing from a higher pedestal and then criticizing you. That's called contempt. So actually what Gottman figured out was if there is contempt, if there is defensiveness, stonewalling, any kind of relationship, the marriage will go through. But if there is contempt in the ratio of one is to five, that means one contempt into five other, any other emotions, he said, it will likely to end up in divorce. Why this example has been pointed out, okay, is so much of a data of a decades of experience and he had so many assistants, okay, in order to go through this entire thing. But finally, he was able to come to one conclusion that it is, leave alone all the data. It's that one single data called contempt. If I'm able to find if there is a contempt in relationship, the marriage may not, it will not go through. In fact, Gottman got to that kind of an expert level, okay? He will eavesdrop in a restaurant where couples are speaking. And based on what they're speaking, not even for 15 minutes, in few minutes, you'll be able to figure out and tell their marriage will be great, their marriage will end up in divorce. Expert again the amount of time that has been spent in order to grasp, thin slice it, analyze it, go into the depth of one thing and find out what will happen. This thin slicing, he also quotes about another example about doctors, why some of the doctors will be sued and why some of the doctors will not be sued. Is it based on their experience, based on their uh, you know, uh, speciality, based on the college they passed out from, based on the language, you know, based on how uh, new they are to that particular area. How much time do they spend with the patients? They went on to collect so much of data, but finally they found out it is not what they speak. It's not the time what they spend, but it is actually the tone in which they, they actually converted the voice into high frequency waves, you know, gibberish basically, uh, frequency waves. And if the frequency waves are higher, they were able to find a correlation of they will be sued. That means the thin slicing is how much ever good the doctor is, wherever he is, whatever specialty, how much ever time he spends, nothing matters. The tone of the doctor is the thin slice that matters. With that one single data, they can figure out whether the doctor will be sued. The possibility of getting sued is more or not. Somehow, Malcolm Gladwell brings these two experiments together, right? And he goes on to say, research base that there is a thin slicing that is possible, probably a subconscious mind or adaptive unconscious mind also will be thin slicing and taking what is required, what is necessary and arrive at addition so very fast. And he says, it's not an exotic gift because as a human being, if we had survived for so many millions of years in this planet, in the most uncertain of the time as a species, he says it's probably because of the, the subconscious mind that is into play in order to take swift decisions. Because fight or flight is a fraction of a second, you know, decision that has to be taken with taking into account a lot of things that are happening around me. So much of a data. It's not possible to process in a conscious mind. It's a central part of what it means to be human. 
It's a gift of reading deeply in the narrow shivers of experience. Any experience what we go through, it will be able to pick up a subconscious mind. It's a gift. It's always out there working to find answers for us. So this is one of the things that he leaves us with a subconscious mind, the way it functions. Now, before I take another break of asking you the questions, or let's interact. Now, when we say the subconscious or adaptive unconscious, the author chooses to call, can we understand what goes behind the closed doors? What really happens there? The snap decisions goes behind the closed door. That means, no, it's not possible for us to find out. If it is possible for us to find out, then it is no more unconscious or subconscious because it become conscious. But one thing is to acknowledge, hey, yes, I can take a snap decisions. It may turn out right as much as a very deliberated thinking decision. But another thing is to trust its mysterious ways. The author in the first part of the book says, let's trust our adaptive unconscious that it is possible for us to know without knowing why we know. We don't know why we know, but yet we know from a lot of inputs that are coming across and our subconscious mind is working. Let me stop here and uh, Divakar, there are many psychologists and people who are professionals on psychology who are sitting over here. So I'm facilitating the book. So what do you think so far of this particular aspect of the book? What do you think about the love lap, thin slicing? Mic testing, am I audible? Yes, TG. You have. What are you have put, you have put the psychologists under pressure, TG, by uh, calling them out. I'm calling my psychologists out. You're saying under pressure. No, I said they, you put them under pressure by calling them out. <laughs> no, no, no. I want there are a few people there who will be able to. They are all there. Let me check. Atulya, psychology student, what do you think about this? And, you know, I'm not calling names. I just want a discussion. So, uh, I haven't really read the book, but, uh, you know, uh, discussing about uh, the conscious and unconscious decision making from the start has been uh, a major part of my syllabus in the first few semesters. So it was kind of intriguing for me to know through studies and stuff. And uh, there are a lot of other factors as well that affects in your decision making. It's not only the unconscious or the conscious mind in reality. So as someone has suggested that it's your past experiences that uh, you know become your unconscious uh, memory or unconscious mind as things go on. It is what you or others call as intuition because you tend to you know judge situations currently based on how well you performed with them in the past and your hunches and everything is like built up on whatever you have done in the past. So it's not like you are doing something uh, new but it's just a pattern. If you analyze everything uh, it will be uh, a pattern. For example we were just watching a uh, a few MGR songs yesterday and uh, Venki usually wears all these uh, color, colorful pants. So I was just jokingly mocking him, uh, you you love MGR so much, that's why you're wearing all these pants. Even his craze for, you know, sunglasses or pens, it might have an inherent or unconscious uh, decision making to the to the liking of MGR. So that is one one decision making style that I found in him. Oh, okay. He didn't he didn't agree though, but I felt like it might be it might be a probable cause for him to like whatever he's doing. And even for me, uh, I off late, you know, all my dress choices have been green. And that is because of uh, Purachita Lady's uh, little affiliation towards her her. So 
I don't know. It's it's a lot of once you think about the unconscious decisions that you make, there are a lot that you you will see a pattern as to how they affect you and how you know you are affected by them. I hope I'm making sense somewhere. Absolutely, I, absolutely. So this is one. It's just you are inherently. It's called priming. Actually, you are inherently primed to do whatever um, uh, you feel like. So that's one thing that I wanted to share here. So great, great, great. Thank you, thank you for sharing. Um, Viji, I just wanted to know whether where can we contact the psychologist John Gottman? Is it? Uh, the Love Lab. You yeah. want to contact him, is it? Yeah, because the thing is that he seems to be very interesting because within 15 minutes of conversation, he is able to predict whether the relationship will go better or it will go. You know that oh, kind actually, of. Actually, actually, you know what? Because he yeah. found this out. Okay. And he is able to do it in two to three minutes. He can eavesdrop and find out. His really? assistants, his assistants will be able to find out now because they know what actually causes the marriage breakage. Okay, oh, that's interesting. See, another thing is that uh, you know, in the, this uh, slicing technique, how much percentage of information is required for making an effective decision? Like, say, for example, in times of war, you know, you can always fix a range. Like, say, for example, uh, I was just talking about uh, in the WhatsApp message also the high quality, high velocity decision making. You know, Jeff Bezos always used to make a kind of percentage between 70 to 90. Like, you know, if you don't have, uh, say, for example, 70% of the information, you don't make a decision. And you don't wait for more than 90% because then the decision making will be slow. You know, that kind of uh, range is what he's talking about. That's so the slicing nice technique seems uh, to be very interesting. Yeah, That's a nice way of putting a, you know, percentage so that people will be able to, because he has to communicate to a large, you know, leadership team. So he has to put some percentage for them to understand, right? But I don't think subconscious mind understands percentages. So it. It, it kind of, it kind of, you know, uh, gets into the snap of the vision and goes through very unconventional mediums. It's not even through conscious mind. It's through the sweat gland. It's through the heart rate. It's through, it's through your body movements. And, you know, you are, you are shivering. It's through the tears. It's, it's, like, it's the various mechanisms. Because he says, the author says, actually, and Atulia may be able to agree with us or agree with the author, that... The mind is the valley of the, you know, the body. So it is in control of the lot of things that are happening inside the body. And it helps not only in terms of the functioning of the body, but also what it wants, the conscious mind wants. So it is all out to look for clues. Okay. So let's move on to the next, uh, you know, part, uh, Anil, and, uh, you know, this will become clearer. I structured the presentation in such a way that, you know, we'll be able to cover some parts of it in a very clear way. Okay. The author talks about a storytelling problem. This is very interesting. Okay. Very interesting, uh, you know, proportion. Now imagine that there is a room which is full of tools and there is a, there are tables, chairs, and all the tools that are available for you. And you put a man inside and two ropes are hanging from the ceiling. So this was the experiment that was conducted where the participants were asked that the distant two ropes have to be joined or they need to pull them together using their two hands. But it is so apart that they will not be able to reach out both of them together. So this is a challenge that has been given to them. So what are all the options that are available? What do you think are the options that are available? So using the table, like you can, uh, you know, uh, take up one side of the rope with some tool, like uh, nail it up on uh, the maximum end, come to the other rope, uh, but take it up to the other uh, maximum end. Maybe if they are reaching out, maybe uh, once like it is done, like maybe you can hold up in his two hands. Just one, one possible. Yeah, 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 it's possible. It's possible. Really good. So you attach the rope to the, uh, you know, the chair or the stool, and then uh, bring it to the center as much as possible and then take the other one and then come uh, come near the table that's the first way brilliant so cut cut both the ropes on the top and uh, tie it in the no bottom. that is not allowed no shortcuts <laughs> very long cut <laughs> yeah that's not there you have to join the ropes he has to hold the ropes together using both the hands the other one anyone anyway any other guess Oh, 
okay the other one is uh, rather the second one take a very long uh, you know impediment like a long uh, uh, stick or something tie it to tie one end to the rope and then take the stick towards the another one and then uh, you know bring the uh, rope by the by the side and then hold both the ropes together that's the second one and the third one is take one of the rope come to the center and using another uh, you know stick with a hook at the end pull the other rope to your towards you and you will hold both the ropes together am i making sense yeah so there are three ways okay but the experiment is all the all the team you know all the uh, participants were asked to find there are four ways and they were breaking their head they were not able to figure it out except for two or three people who were able to figure out the fourth way now all these people were standing and you know around the room and trying to think what could be the you know next to the fourth one and things like that so the experimenter what he did is he went to one of the rope and then gently swung it pulled it and swung it that's all he just pushed it and then swung it and then he came immediately two three people came and they took the rope down to the other end and swung it so forcefully and held the other rope and as it came nearby they held both together and most of them were able to figure it out now are you able to understand this fourth method the swinging of the you know rope yeah very much yeah okay so that's a fourth method now the important part of this experiment is this okay they were asked later to tell how they were able to figure out the fourth method okay so some of them were observing it just dawned on me suddenly i realized this is the way it should be working it was the only thing that was left so i tried it i just realized the cord could swing because it's only hanging so i was i fastened the weight and then you know swung it and the other person said perhaps i am a physics graduate and that's why i was able to figure it out and there was a professor of psychology who said having exhausted everything else the next thing was to swing it i thought of the situation of swinging across the river like monkeys actually singing from the trees i had the imagery of monkeys and suddenly i realized that is a solution the idea suddenly dawned on me this is what all of them say, seem to have said except one or two people who said you gave me a clue guys what do you think is happening here do you think all of them are ashamed that they have been not able to solve the problem they are ashamed to share that actually uh you know i got a clue and that's why i was able to figure it out do you think all of them are telling a lie this is what the experiment is all about what do you guys think maybe they are actually not aware uh, of the clue which they saw uh, it didn't uh... no get inside their mind consciously yeah oh, probably uh, rather than calling it a lie or ashamed uh, probably they don't want to accept the fact that uh, you know the clue was given and uh, with the clue probably something straight and probably they were they were able to relate it with the clue so when when the person swung the rope the guy uh, who says that you know uh, he would uh, cross the river uh, like that it would have probably strike that idea that you know this was the way i had done uh, or i had uh, you know swung through the river and probably uh, so they bring that reason instead of accepting the fact that uh, the clue helped them out am i audible am i audible yeah hey, you are audible yeah now now yes yeah i could hear part of it uh, that uh, maybe they don't want to agree that you know they have been given a clue right Are yeah uh, no what i was telling is one thing is probably they didn't want to accept the fact that uh, after the clue they got the ideas 
and the uh, second thing which i was telling is uh, when he swung the rope uh, as as said uh, as someone was telling that you know the past experiences came up uh, popping up that someone had swung through the river or something like that and uh, instead of accepting the fact that the clue was given they put out their uh, ideas that they had experienced earlier and they came up with those reasons yeah but there actually what the author goes on to say is this is what he calls that as a storytelling problem our subconscious mind takes the decision for us based on the decision based on the clues so when the focused mind was said that there is a fourth option the conscious mind is looking for answers what else to do what can be done uh, what is the angle you know what other tool and all those kind of thing the subconscious mind is also look out in the lookout for the clues so even without their conscious mind being aware of the swinging of the rope by the experimenter it picked up the clue and then it made that okay this is the idea but need not necessarily they had realized actually they got the hint mm. so this is what the author goes on to say that we pick up lot of clues which is happening around us because there is so, so much that is going around even now but our conscious mind can only work in you know 60 km per hour but us can i put it on mute please yeah okay so knowingly or unknowingly the subconscious mind is picking up those clues and finding the answers and is throwing up the answers that's what i i put everybody on mute so unmute and speak so this is what he calls that is a is a you know the power of uh, you know uh, the subconscious mind which is going out to work in order to find the clues and find the solutions and sensing what is happening around this is called as the power of clans he says he says that uh, this is applicable in many of the fields where in the war it's called cop de all i do not know whether i'm pronouncing it right but a military officer who will be able to get the sense of where the enemies are and how the war is going to be planned and take quickest decision possible based on the positions of the army both his as well as the enemies and in basketball also they call that as court sense and in many of the uh in the fields right they they call it as court sense where they are able to sense who is placed where because they need to take snap decisions playing the game in order to win it so this is what the author says any other sharing here uh, this is like i have an experience maybe something similar to this uh, you know usually when i travel in the road when i drive uh i will be able to clearly figure it out uh, if somebody is going to take a right or a left without putting an indicator or if they are going to take up and there is a signal which is open for right side or a u turn depending upon the moment of uh, just a little bit i will be able to sense like this guy is not going to take a right he is going to take a u turn so that he is going to come to a left for some time and then he will take a u turn kind of thing so this thing like i got it maybe in fact like i was wondering maybe this is due to uh, you know years of experience driving on the road whether it has come inside or as you said like a military person he can uh, able to take so uh, take a decision on <coughs> what is going to happen kind of thing so i will be able to clearly you know avoid uh, going and uh, telling him back and wait, uh, wasting my time so uh, i felt like something similar to this uh, so yeah brilliant brilliant share uh, quite quite a good awareness i think Hey, T.J. Sajid here. Hi, Sajid. Uh, just I'm recollecting some uh, probably more than some years back, there was a American pilot who posted some kind of uh, issues on his uh, aircraft. He took the plane and landed in the Hudson Hudson River. Hmm. This was against all practical analysts and whatever the experts said. Hmm. He just went by his instincts, checked all the options, and then I probably think he had less than 90 seconds to decide. despite all the calculations so probably you know yes guts make more sense but again as you were saying the subconscious derives data from the conscious or it's other way around probably i'm not an expert to no kind of pinpoint on it i'll listen to what you say yeah i just my uh, yeah, yeah, beautiful beautiful i i remember that story 
See, uh, uh, I mean, nowhere in the book it says, yeah, through conscious mind, we, you know, the stuff enters into subconscious mind. It's a well-known fact, uh, like what Atulia and Babu also shared in terms of our, um, our preconceived notions, right? And, the, you know, the, the formation that happens. But in this book, I realized that actually a subconscious mind gets the clues even without a conscious mind is aware of, because that's why they're not able to say, hey, I saw that and that's how I figured it out. They were not able to even, you know, uh, mention it because it's not that they are lying consciously. They didn't know that actually they got the clue from the experimenter. Yeah, makes sense. Perfect. It's we beautiful. might have seen. Yeah. Yes, it's yes. Like, amazing. Amazing. Like, you know, so suppose um, I'm, I'm trying to solve the problem while my conscious mind is working out on documents and Excel sheets and, you know, calculations. Okay. My subconscious mind is working in order to find out what is the thin slicing data that is required, the clues that are around the world. It goes yes. around to pick up. Suddenly a call comes, suddenly you land up on a site, suddenly you uh, bounce on a you know, website or you, know, you, you uh, pick up a book which is you know, relevant to you. Some, mm -hmm. some kind of an answer you'll be able to, you meet someone. Absolutely. It's, it's like the investigators, no? they go and check the CCTVs. And suddenly what was already visible to them, they'd look at a new perspective and then find a new, you know, it is, it is there. But once you start seeing that, you make sense of it. Probably, yes, yes, I, I need to agree with you. And uh, yeah, thanks, Prem. Uh, that is the pilot, Chesley Sulenberger. Thanks, Prem, for that. You are always fast coming out with answers. You're so Atiji cool. Sendil here. Hi, Sendil. Yeah, please. Go ahead, no, I just uh, got reminded of uh, one incident that happened to me. Yeah, yeah, you're audible. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to share uh, <clears throat> one incident that happened to me that is very similar to this. So once uh, I was in a uh, some other place and uh, I had to go to a hotel. So as soon as I stepped in, something told me that, okay, I have to try Sambar Vada. Mm. I, I didn't know why, but I went ahead, I ordered. Then after some time, the person sitting next to me also ordered the same. Front of me ordered the same. To my side also ordered the same. So I was thinking to myself that, okay, this uh, hotel people might have been thinking, why some so suddenly everyone is ordering Sambar Vada? Because I ordered, everyone is seeing me and they are ordering is what I thought. But then when I was stepping out, I realized that that hotel was famous for Sambar Vada. Subconsciously, something told me to order that when as soon as I entered in. So that was a nice experience. Maybe Zendil, as you walked in, somebody else was having Sambar Vada. Consciously, you didn't notice, your subconscious mind noticed. Correct. <laughs> Maybe that way also. Brilliant. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, clues picked up by subconscious mind, subconscious. So it's not at the conscious level. Helping us to arrive at the patients faster using thin slicing. That's where we are right now. Very, very interesting. And now let's go on to uh, the next. Hello. Yeah, go ahead, please share. Whenever you want to share, you can share, yes. Okay, so when you're talking about conscious mind and conscious mind and how, you know, uh, we take this, we kind of uh, glance out certain things that we don't realize we've noticed, but they come to use at certain times. I think one of the most beautiful examples given is in a movie called Focus or any illusions that they create, where they make you think of things around that area, very subconsciously in your words and all, which we pick up. You know, our subconscious mind picks up. And when the decision has to be made, these uh, cues that are picked up by the subconscious mind actually makes you do that decision. It, it is like, it's not even in our control. We'll just happen to pick up that decision and we'll wonder why did we even choose it? So uh, in this particular movie, uh, he wants this guy to pick up a pink diamond because that's the only original. The rest are fake. Okay. And for him to do that, there's a pink, there is a blue and there is a green. He, you know, for the past one week, every time pe people pass through him or people talk to him, they will talk about words rhyming with pink, talking about pink and all that. So when he goes there, he just happens to pick up the pink diamond. So things like this, how subconsciously, if you know how to use this tactic, it actually works at your advantage. Very true. Thanks, thanks for sharing that, Ekta. Okay, so moving on to the you know next uh, important takeaway from the book. The first takeaway is as much, just to repeat, as much as 
we trust our analytical skills we can actually trust the unconscious uh, the adaptive unconscious decisions also okay it's as effective that's the first one the second one is when should we trust our instincts and when should we be wary because it is it is without saying you no know, we all give lot of importance to uh time taken for decisions data that needs to be collected analyzed discussed so that we will be able to take a proper decision than you know something which is coming out of the blue and say okay let me take the decision so when is that we need to trust our instincts and when should we vary and that's what he discusses in the book he he talks about the dark side of rapid cognition so he talks about this like what atulya uh, had shared and the patterns that we are built with like the, the situation the culture in which we have been brought up the schools what is studied and things like that and the kind of environment that we move with also plays a role in terms of what the subconscious mind will be it's like a child but is never get tired okay so it's like it keeps on finding the answers for us so the implicit associations prejudices and discrimination if you are showing discrimination against certain certain you know certain things certain people that will come into play at a subconscious level also and that's a dark side so he, he talks about the us example in terms of you know uh, the dark you know the, the the blacks and the you know the whites and you know how we treat you know who suited for what sports and what kind of a profession so people are getting jumbled up you know we have a discriminatory you know attitudes or patterns to our way of thinking in fact uh, when i was talking to my uh, you know um, uh, office mates you know uh, talking about assumptions when i said when when a startup comes to us and approaches what kind of a visual you know form do you have for this person who's approaching and you know what most of them said that it would be a college graduate and when i insisted they said it will be a boy it will be a male so this is the assumption that is there even deep rooted within us that when i say startup it most likely to be a male a young you know a boy rather than a young girl but there are a lot of you know startups being being you know uh, done by even young females but the, the 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 discriminatory things or the patterns that are associated with our conscious mind is such that can play a role this is one of the dark sides of rapid cognition and the second thing picked up from the book is called priming this is a beautiful thing because he talks about one of the jumbled words right the scrambled words and you know people have to put them together so there was an experiment that was conducted two set of college students and one set of college students were given words that had uh, sprinkled with you know these aggressively bold rude disturb intrude those kind of words in which they need to form the sentences and there is another group and for them the words that were given were respect considerate appreciate patiently polite words like that and believe me this is only a 5 minute scramble test that's all at the end of the test what they have to do is walk out into the corridor and find out the examiner and ask him for the next test that's all and this is where actually the experiment is while they are walking in the corridor and approaching this guy this person then you know instead of giving the next set of examination he is supposed to act super busy he should be you know doing something else and he is not minding that these students are coming and asking and that's what the entire test is all about and how these students have reacted now the thing is the first set of students where the sentences were with the words aggressively bold rude disturb and all they could not be waiting there for longer than 5 minutes they have to call and you know pat on the shoulder or make their presence felt and and they said you know what is the next they have to intrude whereas the second set of college students who have been given this respect consider appreciate waited for almost 10 minutes without disturbing most of them he says 84% of them they didn't even bother to test they were waiting patiently so does the world play or play out on our behavior that's the way we think play out on our behavior this is called priming he says in fact if you are fed with the words of old days in the morning some words okay and then we walk the author says that you will be walking slowly because your subconscious mind says hey there is some kind of a clues that i picked up 
which is on old age. So you need to be careful. You need to walk slowly because the environment is such. And that's what your subconscious mind is giving the signals to your conscious mind in your body as a mental valley. So this is a very interesting thing called priming. And priming is used in many aspects, including the labels, what you find. If there is a parsley leaf on a tea bag, you will be able to pick it up because you think it's fresh. And have you realized that most of the you know, jams or most of the uh, sauce, tomato sauce particularly, are red in color. They're not brown, they're not green, they're not, they not uh, white, so to say. They are red in color because you're primed to pick up, oh, that is the red that I want. And you're primed to pick up that. And that's what priming does. So this can also lead. So somebody can actually play around with your subconscious mind decisions, okay? The snap decisions is what the author wants, wants us of. And then the storytelling problem. As you have seen in the rope example, right? These people were able to find out, okay, what is happening, but they were not able to articulate. The same way, if you ask anyone, why did you choose this life partner? Like for example, what Lakshmi had shared, or why did you choose that particular jewelry? The hunch says that I like that. But then when you ask, the author says very beautifully that the subconscious mind has taken the decision. Now the conscious mind finds the reasons well after the decision had been taken. So it says, no, because of this reason, because of that, and because, you know, because I already had that collection and it finds various reasons to justify. Now what happens in this case is, next time when it goes in order to take the similar kind of addition, it works fatal because now the subconscious mind has some more factors to be considered from the conscious mind. So what he says is, whenever you're taking a decision based on hunch feeling, you don't need to overanalyze. And if people say, I like it, leave them there. If people say, I love it, don't ask them for reasons why they love it because it's not a subconscious mind, it's a blocked door. That can never give the answers. They will be coming out with the answers from their conscious mind and that will go on disturbed. If they say, this is what I like to do, the kid is saying, my kid is saying, this is what I love to do. But when I ask why, you will not be able to find the answer. You will be able to give me the answer, but that may not be right. And this is one of the brilliant things that I picked up from this book, the storytelling problem. And that's why even the earlier, you know, in the rope example, they are not able to articulate why actually, uh, you know, they were able to uh, find the answer. Okay. Having covered both the aspects, the first and the second aspect in terms of when you should be wary and you need to trust also. The third thing what the author goes into is then how do we make our adaptive unconscious work form? Is there a way that I can actually train? So uh, I have not put it in the PPT, but uh, but I'm going to cover this because I think it's very apt. So he approaches this particular aspect with uh, impromptu, uh, impromptu, you know, uh, performers, you know, stage performers called uh, Mother. Okay, they are in New York. They are a stage performer. So what basically they do is they come onto the stage and there are performers of 10 to 12 people, male and female, and they ask the audience, give me a topic. So the audience will usually come out with some, some kind of a topic and they will say robotics. Okay, and they will say anything. They will say rocket. They will say anything. Okay, uh, hamburger. And on the stage for 30 minutes, and these people have to come over onto the stage and perform. Completely impromptu, spontaneous act. And when they have to perform this, okay, the, the author says, is this spontaneity is coming out of their already existing humorous stature of their mind, okay? They are, they are like, they're very humorous or the kind of comedians and things like that. He goes backstage and talks to them and find out some of them are very serious. It's not that they are, you know, ready bitters or something like that, no. But you know what? He says, these people practice. He says, spontaneity is not random. Spontaneity is not random. These people practice for lengthy hours, taking topics and practicing. Not that, 
the same word will come when they are actually live on the stage but they keep practicing and there are some tests there are some rules it seems for them to practice and some of the rules are uh one of the rule you know he says that whenever an actor says something okay the other actor has to accept it he cannot refute it this is one of the basic rules look at one of the situation that happens in this particular you know thing so they are called improvisers somebody is talks and then the other guys have to improvise so a i am having a trouble with my leg b i am afraid i have to amputate a you can't do that doctor so the the b becomes doctor now so everybody assumes roles right so because nobody knows who is playing what role b says why not because i am rather attached to it come on man i have got this growth on my arm too now the author says in this situation it is not funny anymore it is leading into a situation where it is not humorous and the, the audience will not be able to like it because the author says at one point of time you can't do that doctor a says because doctor said i am afraid i have to amputate immediately a you know a said you can't do that so you cannot refute that's a rule of that you know impromptu stage performance he broke that rule so the second time the same thing was done ah i'm going to read that narration okay whatever is it man it's my leg doctor this looks nasty i'll have to amputate it's the one you amputated last time doctor you mean you got pain in your wooden leg yes doctor you know what this means not woodworm doctor yes we will have to remove it before it spread to the rest of you yes chair collapses my god it's spreading to the furniture now look how creative they become it's an impromptu but only thing is the rule was that i will not refute so what the author says is even in an impromptu spontaneous act of the audience will say something and these people have to act there is lot of practice that goes and there are a lot of set of rules and that's what makes them spontaneous he establishes that and the second example what he says is he who very very hilariously shares an example of you know uh, having a lunch with two women professional food tasters i do not know whether any of you had met any of these food tasters yeah we can find one in our home right we'll be able to spot whether the salt is there or not without even tasting or whether spice is you know there are some spicy enough or not uh, by the smell you know while it is getting cooked you know cooked but these food tasters are so phenomenally he says that he had a lunch with them and it's a simple restaurant where they can order everything in about 5 minutes time but these people have taken 20 minutes even to order soup and they were talking about at length in terms of what kind of uh, ingredients that go what temperature it will be heated up they are they are having lively conversation they eat food they breathe food they sleep food they study food they are completely occupied with food and malcolm gladwell asked them what are you doing i mean how long you have been into this for which the ladies answer okay let me share my screen okay can you view my screen are you able to see my screen uh, yes 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 teacher yeah teacher it's visible okay so one of the women is saying 20 years it's like medical training you do your internship and then you become a resident and you do it and do it until you can look at something and say in a very objective way how sweet it is how bitter it is how caramelized it is how much citrus character there is and in terms of the citrus this much lemon this much lime this much grapefruit this much orange author introduces a concept called experts when i talked about the archaeologists and the you know the art uh, historians right so the, the sculpture who spotted the koros it's a fake one they have lived breathed and was working only with statues and archaeology right so they are experts in that field spending years of time 
so that the subconscious mind is programmed in order to give spontaneous decisions at the right point of time. He quotes about various other examples. Let me go into that. I mean, okay, this is this is fantastic. Okay, now this is called the jam experiment. Again, about the food. Okay, forty-four different brands of strawberry jams have been taken. The labels have been stripped, and this has been given to the experts. And these experts have gone through the entire tasting, and they have to mark one by one which is superior over the other. on various parameters whatever they know okay and they are the 44 ranked in order now out of this 44 what the experimenters have done is they picked up five okay the 11th one 14th one 21st one 18th one 41st one like that they picked up and they gave it to college students they gave it to college student asking them now you rate Well, you know, how do you rate these strawberry jams in terms of superiority? Which is good for you? Which is bad? Rate from one to five. Now these people also tasted. They are not experts. They tasted. Surprisingly, you know what happened? The findings were that whatever they could find, okay, the correlation was very very high. That means between the experts and the students who came out with the ranking, there was not much of a difference. he says some 0.55 i do not know what is the ratio so the correlation was very very high the statistical parameter that means they are also good in order to judge how a strawberry jam should be but again the experiment didn't stop here because psychology experiments i one thing i understood they will keep continuing till they find some interesting answers right so they went on they asked them why did you pick up these five jams now you have rated now you along with the rating you give why what is the reason now these people have to write the reason so suddenly they are thinking about color they are thinking about the texture they are thinking about the bottle they are take thinking about the temperature they are thinking about the you know the 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 liquidity a lot of things they are you know thinking about it and they are writing because of this because of that and things like that after this they tested the scores of these people who had to answer along with the reasons now they correlation with the expert deferred they are not even close the experts are somewhere which is the the original scores if you are to believe and these people have made so much of a mistakes and that's why this is called a storytelling problem because somehow as a conscious mind i am able to understand you know in a subconscious i am able to understand which jam is good and things like that okay that's it but when you ask me to explain then i go into that kind of a this thing where i need to next time when i experiment and run i need to follow that particular pattern and they are making mistakes but the experts on the other hand for each of the taste what they have done they were able to say why they are choosing they had the language so the experts have their vocabulary i'm not talking only about the experts in terms of the food right for example for jam the vocabulary the author says they have six dimension appearance alone color intensity shine chroma lumpiness bubbles 10 dimensions of texture they have to rate 1 to 10 14 dimensions of flavor which is divided into aromatic taste and chemical feeling now based on all this over a period of time you remember the 20 years that woman was talking about the professional food taster having done that it goes so deep inside them that by the look of it they will be able to say they don't even need to taste it because that's what they are, you know they are say the experts arrive at a snap decision based on years of experience or expertise they gather the author says low lab again is an experiment the jam he talks about other curious you know experiments which is for a tennis coach where they figured out it's not because of the you know the wrist twist in the hand and you know people can actually uh you know the, like andre agassi was able to score uh you know uh the you know the, the scores in the tennis is because of the twist so the the coach is data is analyzed to that extent facial expressions is another an expert level i mean it's, it's amazing there are 4000 facial expressions possible with just five muscles in our face and people have done experiments on that and to find out with this kind of a face expression this is what this person must be going through 
and having gone through at a very expert level they don't need to refer all that by looking at the face they will be able to read what the person is going through agatin araga mogathil teru so that's when i realized okay some people are able to you know come out with these kind of proverbs based on this because i can read the facial expression based on what's happening so the author says outside our areas of expertise like the experts are able to do that in food and you know various experiments but when you get into the areas of expertise yes they are able to reason out outside of our areas of expertise our snap gel reactions may not be wrong but they are shallow when i mean shallow he says that it can be questioned if somebody comes and confuses or somebody does a prime uh, you know on you or prepares you or puts another color you will be able to or ask you a story you will be able to get confused there are, but for an expert whatever happens they will be able to rate re-rate again and again the same way and that's how they have created their expertise so the author concludes by saying that there are three important things in the book of blink one decisions made quickly can be every bit as good decisions made cautiously and deliberately when should we trust our instincts when should we vary and snap judgments and first impressions can be educated and controlled talking about the expertise there are a lot more examples the author gives in terms of um, uh, substantiating but the most important thing that i liked about what the author uh, handles the subject is a storytelling way he actually takes this entire topic of uh picking and choosing you know the researchers what experiment they have conducted connecting them going back to them and talking about it it's a such a easy read provided you are interested in the subject and hope in this meeting you develop some kind of an interest in this subject so discussion time yeah tg i could relate this to uh surfing when i do surfing no like what happens is that you get those waves coming up to you you know you you just take the board and go towards the waves and as soon as you see that this wave is going to have that speed you turn the board and then try to catch the wave so that you the board moves along the, with the wave and then you stand on it like that old spice advertisement and then you know you can have a kind of now in that what happens is that your instinct should tell you that the moment you are at the base of the wave you should just pop up say for example if you delay popping up when the crest of the wave comes and hits you you are out in the sense you will have a somersault okay so that instinctively you should have that uh, this thing to stand up and then uh, you know you you move yourself in such a way that you get that balance so both the physical and the mental you know uh, what uh, what was told that uh, the instinct as well as the physical sensation both should work together then only you will be able to stand and you know you can do a very good surfing so i could relate to that you know how the instinct could work and how one can train you know very important thing is that Uh, you train your body along with the movement of the waves and it needs a lot of training like you know the popping up it's like a uh, kind of what you call the push ups you know the push ups should be very faster you should be able to stand up within a snap of a moment and take that wave take the speed of the wave so something uh, you know the, the practice that we have i think i can relate to what you have told now yeah thanks anand what's your takeaways from this book discussion that is jisendel here again yes yeah, and then yeah now i understand why some of my clients say they don't like this idea but not able to explain why they don't like it <laughs> <laughs> yeah true yeah most of the times they wouldn't know i mean they would just say they like it or they don't like it right but they when you ask for okay what you don't like it they will not be able to explain maybe but we will not be able to get any input to improve or uh, do anything about it but yeah. uh, can i say they are not expert enough to explain because yeah. expert will be able to explain so correct correct yes that's right true very sure. good prem is our food tester yes sir ta yeah others please please share you are learning can i yeah dara please sir yeah so i think uh, the storytelling part is something uh, which i'll be taking up uh, with this meeting i'll i'll take along and probably because i feel i have to improve on that because even when i was trying to put up my point of uh, explaining the thing which i earlier spoke in this meeting i was not exactly i i think i myself was not exactly able to i was not convinced that i'm able to convey my point uh, very clearly 
so uh, this is something i think i'll be able to, you know i will want to uh, improvise on to me i understood that yeah there is something called body memory also no which goes along with the instincts you, know, you develop that body memory is it not body the body memory the memory body that memory, you have yeah. in they, your they, body yeah, i think, I think they gave develop. a word like that it's uh, i yeah. would say I, i i hope you know some of yoga practitioners it's called body mind right so, yeah. so the yeah. memory that you have within the body which can be developed you know like what you said a uh, spontaneity is being trained it doesn't come by itself it can be trained yeah. you know something like that you know the, your your body can be programmed your body can be uh, developed to have that memory by means of practice yes very spontaneous game like you know a basketball you know yeah. a team sport it's a spontaneous because you, the split of a second you need to you know communicate with the team and then handle because what going to come around that situation nobody knows correct that is the kind of a game where actually they play again and again and again and again because that the team has to understand you know the entire uh, it gets you deeper inside okay so you it can be you know body memory body mind subconscious mind any name they give it is that Correct. that which is guiding us yeah that's what bruce lee says no if i am afraid of that person who practices a technique 10000 times rather than a person who practices 10 techniques maybe lesser number of times than that yeah. isn't it yeah in sports you have something called the set piece i mean all the elite teams you know they practice set piece so given that situation when it happens in the live environment their muscle memory kicks in and they just go and execute it finish i mean there is no thought process nothing like that you just it's like you know somebody shave or getting a six you see the ball there is no hand eye coordination you just hit it finish but we can't try it muscle memory yeah yep. it's another word sports medicine uh tg i have a question uh, is there some relation between the uh, age and the uh, uh, blink whatever which we call uh, conscious subconscious memory kind of thing say the concept of uh, the author says is that like uh, the decision which is taken uh, in a sub, uh, instantly uh, is as equally good when we take it consciously okay so does this vary or differ uh, based upon the age is there some mention in the book about it as because like uh, practice has been uh, explained repeated uh, actions like uh, give uh, lead them to some uh, you know uh, whatever memory kind of thing are all been spoken about so is there some age factor which has been discussed? Yeah, uh, not not in this book yes uh, to my knowledge he has not mentioned anything relating to age and the you know uh, the functioning or the the speed of the blink so to say um, but uh, i'll be happy to have somebody else answer the question for you what was it it was relating to age and this one is it age and instinct is it yes yes i don't think so there should be a limit of age because uh, practice can be done at any age you know any sport if you practice no not the uh, is talking about the blink the the spontaneity yeah the spontaneity can be practiced no at any age i don't think so age should be a barrier for that because the moment you start doing it developing it i think uh, that should come no yes sir i can understand my question is that you know uh, whether the result varies because like when you are young you are practicing timing is less when you are old like the practicing time is uh, more so is there some difference of results based upon uh, the by the, time, by the time babu i mean if i have to answer that you already become an expert on you know one area see um, that's why i think we need to uh, kind of decide okay which area we would like to become an expert on yeah. because it's not uh, i mean, I mean uh, there's another book also that i'm reading which is called range which is how the generals are you know ruling the world but uh, if i have to develop an expertise uh, you know in an area i need to practice it more number of times so that i put my subconscious mind into work and i can take snap decisions this is what the book you know concludes uh without getting primed and i can explain and things like that and i can practice uh, uh an expertise in an area only which area which are passionate about because otherwise so many hours of, you know years 20 years of my practice will not come into an area where i'm not and how many areas will be be passionate about apart from that it's not that the subconscious mind will not work another will not work in other areas it will keep working 
with its limited information and limited clues that is not limited, unlimited, okay? Clues that is picking up on things like that. I guess it will keep working. But only thing is it will be shallow. It can be primed. Uh, it can be controlled, uh, you know, by uh, storytelling. True, DG, like uh, that's what, as you said, like uh, we had another book, The Talent Code, which says that 10,000 hours of uh, yeah. practice leads to, you uh, know, anybody practices 10,000 hours on anything, they become an expert. That's okay. a separate book. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, my point was that, like, as you said, like, yes, uh, shallow is, is there definitely when they are young. So, right now, here we are speaking about blink. Okay, <laughs> so to that context, I am just uh, trying to explore. Uh, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you. May not, I will. We have to research on that. Probably pick up another book. <laughs> but no mention about age in this book, Babu. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I would love to hear from others also. I mean, floor is open for another five minutes. Your your takeaways. I'm just blinking, TJ. <laughs> <laughs> the video on, no? No, that is good actually. Blinking is good. Because whenever we use uh, computers or, uh, you know, smartphones, I think constant blinking should be there at uh, periodic intervals so that your eyes are healthy. <laughs> hey, <Tata. Hey>. <laughs> <laughs> now you can blink. <laughs> What is very uh, interesting for you, Sata? No, no, I, sorry, I joined uh, a bit late, but I have this book, TG. I was just chatting with Prem at the back end. Uh, the book, actually, I a few pages, I just kept it aside many years back. I'm telling you about 10 years back, 10, 12 years back, I bought it. It's still there in my library. I think I should, uh, this year, uh, uh, today's uh, presentation has uh, kindled some, uh, I mean, interest. I think I should go back and uh, take it again and read it. Uh, but I come unprepared for this meeting. But uh, uh, as usual, you did, did a great job in presenting, putting things together. But uh, as others shared, there are so many, Amavarkalinariya, uh, Namari, uh, these situations have been uh, like how Babu told no that uh, somebody is taking a right turn or left turn, and uh, people talked about sambar vada. So the yeah. I could be able to relate to many of those uh, incidents. So, but apart from that, I I am I'm not able to uh, share anything out of the discussion today. Okay. Thank you, DJ. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, TG, do you think that extra information always, you know, distracts or, you know, take you away from the, the thing? Because sometimes, you know, we tend to realize that uh, extra information paralysis, that analysis is paralysis kind of thing. See, we are, you're, you're talking about when, now? Yeah, in, any time for that matter, you know, we wait for the information. We say that, let me again wait for some more information before we I... Trust, we trust our conscious mind, right? So that's how we have been trained on. So we trust that is why I think probably many of the entrepreneurs, I think uh, they become very successful. Those who don't have uh, much uh, education, you know, because they don't have anything to bank upon. You know, there are so many examples of that where they go by their hunches more than any kind of rational uh, I analysis. I don't attribute that to education by any way, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah. But, but uh, yeah, what you're saying is like, you know, but then, uh, yeah, but then if you have too much information, to too much information, I, I think. I think uh, it paralyzes you sometimes. Yeah, the, even in the management, there is analysis paralysis. There. Correct, correct. Because so, we tend to analyze everything too much, but, and but by the time somebody else would have already taken an action. But if you take a medical field, uh, this is Divak here, but if you take medical field, they will have too much of information with them. Yeah. The doctors has to take a decision with too much of information. So the technique what doctors use is uh, they go with the Elimination based uh, management, like how we used to, um, uh, if you are preparing for GMAT, I still remember the technique uh, they communicate is how quickly you are going to eliminate the extra information which you currently have. So doctors use that as a strategy to eliminate uh, the too much of information with them and then quickly make a decision to take it forward. So we are today living, that's what author tried to communicate in that book, uh, Blink is, 
we are without our awareness we are loaded with too much of information and how we are able to make a quick decision is uh, we need to eliminate uh, the extra information smartly and do we have a framework for that right so that's 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 how where it operates right so we today uh, without our awareness information overload is very high and and uh, and and i'm getting struck because i do not know how to eliminate that extra information that's where the analysis paralysis occurs the slicing is not happening uh, effectively and and we can interview some doctors actually they way this, this is what i learned from one cardiologist which he has explained how they <coughs> they eliminate the symptoms uh, for them to narrow down the actual problem of the uh, patient and it comes with an uh, experience is what i learned i thought that i can share it uh, anil uh, based on the problem statement which we are uh, discuss on i think that's a very relevant point because based on the existence because when you talk about medical this thing and all that it is based on the life of a person it, i think uh, there i think uh, one needs to be very careful uh, rather than no i think it depends on the situation and the kind of decision that one takes right no true yeah. true that's where where they go with an approach on how to eliminate it they won't go with the uh, so the 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 hypothesis on their decision you won't go with the evidence based is it like it will be elimination exactly. yeah. yeah so they will form an hypothesis they have to figure it out so for example if i get a cough okay. for a cough i may be having uh, uh, 10 diseases related with the cough as a symptom so they should eliminate okay it is not a covid okay by taking a covid test i am removing it then i'm taking a blood test um, i'm removing it okay all the basic uh, uh, items are really good i'm eliminating it so that's the reason why doctors are advising us to do uh, n number of tests for them to eliminate it actually so it has both plus and minus i am not going on that but the reason for them to take uh, too many tests is to eliminate uh, that there is no problem which is related with the symptom to take it okay. yeah that's a good point thank you Thanks, Dr. Anybody else want to share? So, TG, finally, I mean, like the more we blink, the better we get at blinking, or the better we blink, the more uh, we blink. Which is no. this? The Korea? The more, when, you, when you say the more you blink, uh, uh, you are you are putting blink into a conscious state. It is not true. Oh, is it? You think about okay. it, no? Hmm. Some some questions. No? Which which? today to attend the session or not now to speak or not which book to select which binge watching to you know do this weekend which of these uh, you know um, headphones would i buy like kalpana said which which jewelry i'm going to buy you know you stand there and you decide which shirt which shirt color and sometimes there are so many things that going around and you know helping us to take a decision which we are not even aware of so somebody was saying this is a very heavy subject uh, it looked to me even initially it was a very heavy subject but at a grassroots level you know what i would like to summarize is under the otherwise anybody navani manoj you want to you know talk or should i summarize as a facilitator i have a lot of things to talk so i'm thinking whether to talk or not <laughs> what is stopping you he is very uh, okay regarding the decision making uh, in a business perspective yeah any short term goals can be taken very quickly with a limited time consumption any long term impacts kind of decision needs to be taken long term i mean lot of time but there is exception this is only for business but for life partner choice Miss Lakshmi said, "Right, she went ahead and cho- chosen in a blink of, in a blink. So this is not applicable there. So how can we generalize a statement? Did we generalize a statement? Oh, well, I think uh, he was talking about more of uh, Navin was talking more of short term and long term. More than that, I think we should see whether we can reverse our decision at a later stage." whether the decisions are reversible or irreversible supposing if our decisions are reversible then i think blinking can help because we can always reverse the decision 
but if suppose the decisions are irreversible i think uh, we need to take lot of analysis but that is where ms lakshmi said what she said she went ahead and took a decision in a blink but that decision cannot be irreversible uh, i mean at least in a right but navani most of us make our marriage decision based on a blink on so all blinks are right arrange marriages it's it's just a blink it just you know the chemistry works like you know okay it might work Everybody arrange knows. marriages we never take decision finally when you decide when you decided okay finally okay it was something okay it was it is not a rational thing in in arranged marriages the two person who were going to live together they never take decision <laughs> they don't even have the right to blink forget about detailed expertise decision they don't have rights to even blink <laughs> but after that after the marriage there are so many moments of blinks okay and we can you only have to blink there is no other option <laughs> Yeah, more that patterns, that more patterns, uh, positive, you know, storytelling. Lot of things can be done. Psychologists are there to help. They will counsel us and make our marriage right somehow. Okay. I think the most, lot of the book has been summarized now. <laughs> <laughs> most of the Western logics don't apply to Indian marriages. Yeah, absolutely, Shadi. Absolutely, Shadi. Uh, one more part I would like to talk about is the correlation between expertise. blink decision and what is right decision okay all blink decisions are shallow that is mean we have discussed about it all blink decisions are shallow it can be right yeah yeah shallow in the sense you may be right but you can you could go wrong because of your preconceived notions or mm -hmm. somebody would have primed you Okay, you would have seen something. You would have seen that ad, and that's why you are buying. That like the sambar vada, what central or thing. You would have probably seen somebody else, and the hotel is famous for sambar. Somebody else is, you know, having the sambar vada. He smelled the sambar vada. There is so much that is happening, and then he ordered for it. But he thought it's his own decision. It's the blinking and the stuff. Yeah, so let's not complicate. Okay, I would, I would put it this way. Okay. I put it this way. I heard, okay, it's not proved, but it's I heard. If uh, mind out of the entire portion of the mind, one eight is our conscious mind, and seven eight is subconscious mind. Okay, this is not proved anywhere. Nobody has researched and sliced, and you know they found it's not. It's it's such a subtle thing, so we cannot say. But in order to say, okay, the proportion of how our conscious mind is guiding the life and subconscious mind is continuing to guide our life the subconscious mind works based on one thing what i want the conscious mind want and then the subconscious mind without even the awareness of the conscious mind goes out in order to search the clues in order to satiate so if i'm clear in the conscious mind what i want the subconscious mind is put to work if i'm not clear it is going around beating everywhere knocking every door getting confused it continues to do it continues to drain our energy okay and the second thing is whether we are thinking or not okay the subconscious mind is thinking so yaariya vandu we will not ask any more yoschi seiriya illiya abbi nam kekkave mudiyadhu ena at least 7 8 of his mind is working always the subconscious mind so ellaro yoschite da irukanga whether they are conscious or not so this is how i would say and i am very happy whether i am sleeping or awake or working on this or not and the goals and things are that seven eighth of my mind is already always without taking a break working my job is to now to make it work in the way i should be able to make it work become an expert on one area the choose an area of my passion and make it work continuously and the other areas let it take a spot decision let me go with it that's all let it help me but i have decided and i am also asking all of you that please give weightage to your hunches also please give weightage to you know your your uh, the decision that is coming spontaneously also mix it up with your cognitive you know uh, thinking and conscious strategies mix it up give enough weightage that's what i would say
That's what the book says, and that's what I learned, and that's what I'm picking up. And I'm signing off as a facilitator for this session. Thank you so much. Brilliant, for brilliant, DJ. Joining, joining today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all, folks. Nice. So much. I'm stopping the recording. Thank you, DJ.